Okay, an extremely overlit Mrs. Chester here, along with the cat. You can only see the ears of, anyway. Uh, I got back to the Tagore stories. This overlighting really makes this, this shirt look a hell of a lot more interesting than it is. As you can see, it's, it's, it's really salmon colored. Anyway, so I left off somewhere with the, with the Tagore stories. And I watched three more today. I was going to go into it last night, but somebody else was using my account. So, again, the names are unimportant. Um, uh, and I may, I may even actually be skipping something here, but uh, let me give you these three for part three. I think I'm up to about chapter 18 or so. Okay, the first one. There's this boy whose name is Fatik. Um, his mom's a widow, and he's got a younger brother who... Bizarrely, doesn't look anything like him, but that seems to be de rigueur, isn't it? In um, Hindi movies, that siblings don't look anything like each other. You know, like Salman Khan and A.J. Gevgon, and Salman Khan and Shah Rukh Khan. Doesn't matter. So anyway, this kid, who's uh, a bit of a pudge, he goes uh, back to the city with his uncle, the, the widow's brother, because the widow is having a hell of a time uh, taking care of them both. So he's taken by his uncle to study, and the kid is not impressed by the house. Says, oh, you know, you're in the city, and I thought you'd have a, a big palace you don't. And, and the uncle has two boys of his own who think that this kid, Fatik, is a, a rube and say, no, he's not related to me, and, you know, don't want to hang out with him and stuff. And his, um, he writes to his mom and says, you oh, know, they're being really good to me, and meanwhile, they're not being really good to him, and we... We see the replay and replay of how crappy the kids are. So, um, the, the mother, um, the mother of uh, the two boys, that is to say, his, his aunt doesn't care for him either. She's like, you know, i got to take care of him too. Which, of course, is true. Like, here's another boy in the house. Here, he's going to live with us, says husband to wife. And, of course, wife has no say. So, anyway, the kid is upset. And in the rain, he goes out and he develops um, he develops juvenile old movie disease. In other words, he's got the uh, uh, cat leaves in disgust. So he, you know, he has a cough and he's dying or whatever. And, and, and then his mom comes to see him. And his mom, you know, is, is there and his brother's there. And, and the uncle had promised Fatik that he could go back uh, once the holidays had come. So he sees his mom and goes... Have the holidays come? End of story. Why? Why did this story exist? I have no clue. Second one. The second one is an intercast drama. You know, cast, which is... What time is it? Still still important at this very second in the 21st century. Anyway, uh, there's a woman named Kush somebody. She's adopted. She's adopted. She was adopted by this guy. And this other guy likes her. And they lie that say, you know, they don't lie. They lie by, but lie by omission. You'd think they were Catholic. They lie by omission. And everybody assumes she's a Brahmin, but she's not. And she's like, well, I was going to tell you to person, but, but I couldn't. And then it was too late. It's so soap opera. So, so of course, the guy is like freaking out. And the guy's father's like, well, now, you know, unless you get rid of this woman, your sister's not going to be allowed to get married because that's what it's all about, ain't it? It's all about that familial pressure. Well, uh, the not a Brahmin isn't a problem. Hooray, the man decides not to banish her, and the father doesn't have to eat dirt after all. Literally, eat dirt. Third one. We open up on this woman. Again, a woman is sick. A woman's sick, and her father-in-law won't pay for the medicines. He's got shit tons of cash, but he won't fork out the 20 rupees. So the woman dies. Meanwhile, the, this cheap bastard is doting on his grandson, who I think is a bit of a pain in the ass and, like, you know, rips his doty and, and uh, tries to spill ink on his papers and all this shit. I, I thought at first the kid had a mental difficulty, but I guess he was just supposed to be an amusing toddler. He looked like he was about three. And then, uh, so the father, you know, like I said, the father, his wife is dead because of, cause of his father. So he takes the boy and he takes off. And the, and the old man starts to go slowly nuts. I really enjoyed this part because he deserved to be alone. And he's like wandering around. He's all disheveled and, you know, 
spilling his food and stuff around. Uh, because he was a, a selfish prick. And then what happens? Oh, yeah. Um, anyway. Um, so he meets this boy who's a runaway. You know, these kids are chasing him or something. And this other kid comes up and, like, rips his doty again. And he's like, who were you? And he's like, oh, I run away because I don't want to go to school. Now, we all know. Yeah. We all know that this is the grandson, even though he doesn't look anything like the other kid. And, and we have what, what's called, again, in the movies, the, the, the conceit of disrecognition. The fact that the child has been away for five years means he totally doesn't recognize him. And, and the grandfather doesn't recognize the grandson, and the grandson doesn't recognize he used to live in this place. Yeah, I believe this. So, so the grand, this boy, who has got some other name, goes to the guy's house and he's living there and he's like getting spoiled and he's like I don't want to go back because then I'd have to go to school so then the the neighbor says to grandpa you know this person is looking for his son he's gonna come any day now so you better you, you know so they the old man takes him to this temple which is like near the near the um, some river it's this ancient you know green temple and there's this trap door and in there down the ladder is this secret room it's stuffed full of gold and don't ask me who's prepared in advance it's also got all these little candles around and it's got the the fresh marigold and it's got the um the little ceremonial fire in the middle i don't know who did this but um anyway so he goes down there and says all this treasure is mine i'm thinking again you fucking prick you fucking prick you let your daughter and will die but neither here nor there the point is that uh he's gonna like give this kid the money and all I have is yours, but you have to recite this thing over and over. So he says, I must, you know, I'll keep it, but I'll give it if the family comes back. I'll keep it if the family comes back. And I'm thinking, is the grandpa going to run away? Is the kid going to shut grandpa in this gold-filled tomb? No. Well, the grandpa goes up there, leaving the kid in there, closes the door, and then, oh, who should he see outside but his son? And his son's like, um, yeah, that's your grandson. I'm your son. We changed our names. Because you were such a bastard. Meanwhile, we don't know if the kid is asphyxiated or if the old man is so dotty he doesn't remember where he put the boy. And he's like, have you, have you, do you hear a, do you hear a child cry? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I watch these things because I enjoy the settings and I really like the music. Again, there's these ridiculous, pointless, does not advance the plot music. It's basically like cutting two hours and 35 minutes out of a three-hour Bollywood. Okay, and the next one has some people playing tennis, but I wasn't about to do it now. So that's Mrs. Chester telling you part three of Tagore, and hopefully I'll get to part four. Eight minutes, three stories of sorts. Bye.